When you think of World War II aviation, usually you think of planes. You know, because there were a lot of planes. I mean, that makes sense. And what you definitely don't think of are helicopters. Helicopters in World War II? I mean, if we're thinking of Vietnam, definitely. And Korea, for that matter. But the technology was still very much in its infancy during the Second World War. And as such, some people don't even realize that they got any use at all, but some did, in fact, enter service during the conflict. And I decided I wanted to make a list talking about these peculiar early attempts at helicopter development. As we haven't talked about helicopters in a while, and... Hey... Early helicopters are a fun thing to discuss. I had one rule for this, and that is, they have to be actual helicopters. No gyrocopters or anything like that. And I tried really hard to make the entire list ones that actually entered service. And I did not pull this off, um, but I got very close. There's only one exception to that particular rule. But I did make an attempt to only include helicopters that did attain operational status during World War II. These are five helicopters of World War II. The Dobelhof WNF-342 is the only exception to the rule on this list because this is experimental. And it was so interesting, and pushing the envelope when it came to technology at the time, that I thought it was worth discussing. It is a helicopter, but it is a tipjet helicopter design, which is highly unusual. A tipjet design involves a nozzle at the, well, tips of helicopter rotor blades, and those are what are used to spin the rotor. Since it avoids a shaft drive, it places no torque on the airframe, and thus, a tail rotor isn't required. 342 is, in fact, the first helicopter to take off and land using tip jets. In order to help provide airflow across its rudder, it actually did have a rear-facing prop, and it was driven by a standard piston engine. But the helicopter also had an air compressor that supplied air through the rotor head after being mixed with the fuel. This passed through the hollow rotor blades into a combustion chambers at the tips. The idea was sound, and it did technically work, though the big drawback of this is it did have a much higher rate of fuel consumption. But testing went all right, at least in terms of stability, but for one thing, the tip jets were loud, really loud. And it was also found that the acceleration of the airflow inside the rotor blades actually caused issues with steady combustion, though there were still issues to work out. But they did make multiple versions of the craft, though it never attained production status prior to the end of World War II. The Sikorsky R-4. This is a two-seat helicopter that looks more like an actual helicopter, it was, in fact, the world's first large-scale mass-produced helicopter, and they would build a total of 131 of them. It was introduced on January 5th, 1943, and utilized by the United States Army Air Forces, the Navy, the Coast Guard, as well as the UK's Royal Air Force and Royal Navy. The Coast Guard referred to it as the HNS-1, and the British called it the Hoverfly, but in any event, they were the same thing, pretty much. Early tests of the helicopter showed promise. The prototype, the XR-4, exceeded all previous helicopter endurance altitude and airspeed records, demonstrating vast potential for further development of the technology. And it was quickly realized that this particular craft would be excellent for both scouting, but in particular, rescue duties. The first one of those would be carried out by U.S. Coast Guard Commander Frank Erickson who flew one on a mission carrying life-saving blood plasma for the casualties resulting from the explosion of USS Turner in January of 1944. The first combat rescue happened on the 22nd and 23rd of April in 1944, carried out by U.S. Army Lieutenant Carter Harmon of the 1st Air Commando Group. Despite the fact that the helicopter technically could only carry a single passenger, he managed to rescue four individuals in the China-Burma-India Theater taking two at a time. 
the R4s definitely showed promise and continued to serve throughout World War II, but after it, they started being phased out pretty quick. And this was simply because, as early helicopters, they were... they were a nightmare to fly. No, really, they were awful. They were not a joyous experience to keep in the air. Their blades were made of wood ribs around a steel spar, and they were covered with doped fabric. They were difficult to keep rotating in the same plane, and tended to shake violently. On a modern helicopter, they would likely have a governor to control the rotor's speed, and therefore try to dampen down this particular problem, but the R4 just straight up didn't have a governor. So the pilots had to correlate the throttle with collective pitch inputs. Apparently the control stick shook horrifically, so the pilots had to keep a firm grip on it all the time. If they let go for even a second, the R4 would go completely out of control. So, yeah, they weren't very much fun in this regard, and improvements had to be made. But they were an early and pivotal step in creating a functional helicopter. The Flettner 282. Calibri, which translates to Hummingbird. This intermeshing rotor helicopter, or Synchropter, was produced by Anton Flettner of Germany, and was the world's first series production helicopter. They built 24 of them. The prototype first flew in 1941. The Synchropter design involves two main rotors turning in opposite directions, with each rotor mast mounted on a slight angle to the other. So when they spin, they intermesh without actually hitting each other. It's obviously a delicate setup, but has its benefits, and the 2A2 had an excellent engine, known as the SH-14, a very reliable piece of equipment that had a low specific power output and low power to weight ratio. They could run for up to 400 hours without major servicing, and since these helicopters were small, they didn't necessarily need a super powerful engine to do what they did. Plus, in the case of engine failure, switching from powered mode to auto-rotation was automatic, which is a very innovative and forward-thinking design attribute. The intended roles of it included ferrying items between ships as well as recon work, but as the war shifted against Germany, the Luftwaffe began considering it for battlefield uses, mostly to help with artillery spotting. The 282s were remarkably stable, even in bad weather, so much so that the German Air Ministry issued a contract in 1944 to BMW to produce 1,000 of these things. But their Munich plant was destroyed by Allied bombing raids after they produced just 24 of the series. Of the ones that got into service, most would be destroyed by Allied attacks, but a single example was captured by the Soviets, and two were captured by America. It's not really known what happened to the Soviet one, but as for the two that were captured by America, one is partially intact at the Midland Air Museum in Coventry, England, but the other is... <sighs> confusing. At one time, it was located at the National Museum of the United States Air Force in Dayton, Ohio, but it was loaned at one point to Pruitt Aircraft, and then disappeared. And according to the research division at the museum, the craft had been acquired in 1949. Kept in storage for years, it would then place on loan to the Sampson Air Force Base in New York in 1954. When Sampson closed in the summer of 1956, all items then on exhibit were returned or disposed of in place. The 2A2 wasn't sent back, so I have no idea where this thing went, basically is what I'm trying to say. They don't even know how it was destroyed, but to the museum's knowledge at this point, it was most likely scrapped at Sampson, but no public record of its disposition has been located. So yeah, that that's that's great, guys. It's this is wonderful. That was a piece of history, but it's it's fine. Just lose it. Why fantastic? But they were really good helicopters for their day. The Sikorsky R6. This is another American light two-seat helicopter, also developed in the 1940s, first flying in 1943 and introduced in 1945. So this barely counts as a World War II helicopter, I admit this. It was developed directly from the R4, and there was an R5 in between them, I know, that it also technically entered service during the war, but it lasted a lot longer after the war, too. This one didn't. 
It came with a new streamlined fuselage, and the boom carrying the tail rotor was lengthened, as well as straightened. They did keep the main rotor and transmission system of the R4, which implies to me that the R6 was just as much of a nightmare to fly as the R4 was, but it was faster, without question, and they wound up with 225 of this particular model. While they did see service, they didn't wind up doing too much. By 1948, they were already on secondary duties, for the most part, and disposals of surplus R6s were made in the civil market in the late 1940s, and none are operational in the modern day, though four did survive to be in museums, so overall, another interesting step in helicopter development. Fokka Echelis FA-223 Drak, which translates to DRAGON. NICE. This helicopter was developed by Germany during World War II, and is noted for being the first helicopter to attain production status, but not exactly widespread production status, because they only made 20 of them due to Allied bombing raids. This helicopter, as you can see, has a dual rotor design, and was developed off the success of the Fokker Wolf FW-61, which is generally considered the first practical and functional helicopter in and of itself. But the Drock took what the 61 did and ran with it. And in fact, it was just an enlarged version of it. And the first untethered flight of the V-1 prototype occurred on August 3rd, 1940, after over 100 hours of ground and tethered testing. Certain attributes showed it was very impressive, with a top speed of 113 miles per hour, a climb rate of 1,732 feet per minute, and a maximum altitude of 23,300 feet. This performance was far greater than any other demonstrated helicopter in the world at that time, but the truck still wasn't ready for military service, and thus Fokka at Gellis were told to accelerate their development program. The V-1 was lost in an accident following engine failure, and it was too low for auto-rotation. V-2 was completed after it, but that got destroyed by an Allied bombing raid, and then V-3 was made, and serial production of the 223 began at the factory in 1942. Then they were hit by an air raid. Plans to restore production at that site were abandoned in 1943, and they moved to a new plant at Lopheim. Then they were hit by another air raid in 1944. Really, they weren't allowed to make any. It's not permitted. Like I said, they only managed to push out 20 by the time production ended, because the Allies were like, no. Absolutely not. While the craft were certainly good for rescue and recovery efforts, they were not so great at, like, fighting. And as such, there was really nothing about them that was going to change Germany's fortunes in any way at that point in the war. But the technology was definitely interesting, and influences a lot of double rotor designs today. And with that, a special thank you to all my underwater train finders, some dude 267, Orange Glass, Benjamin Owens, Anzac A1, Arthur Roy, Brian, Jack Carson's Railway Videos, Lord Off 444, A Purse 723, Royal Hunter 2060, I Surfer 1405, Charles Kwiatkowski, Matt Weaver, Tom Red Lion, NS Productions 8104, Wheeljack 8401, Rescues Greyhounds, The Baxter, Caleb Crossway, Ohio Trucker 1, Andrew Bowen, Josh Johnson, Caleb Rainwaters, Prez Drenton, Master of None, Mr. Sleepy, Travis Delinsky, Jared Brussel, Joshua Long, Tommy Rossini, Ben McCullough, Panzer Kitson 131-232, Mark Holding, Dr. Racer 78, G Wiz, Mr. Terevel, Liam Wright, Hayden DeGrow, Metal for Life Guy, Battle 604, Hannah Bird, Railroad Preserver 2000, No, Eric Hutton, and of course, my dad. Till next time, this is Dark This, and I bid you all a fun farewell.